Welcome to section 5.7. All right, gentle people, in this lecture, what we're going to discuss is diffusion and effusion. So let me give you guys an example. Say I take a bottle of perfume and I smash it against the wall in one corner of the room. What's going to happen is that the smell of the perfume is going to be concentrated in one area of the room. But eventually, it is going to fill that entire room. And this is because gas molecules are going to spread out and they are going to uniformly distribute themselves across the entire volume that is available to them. And this is the idea of diffusion. Diffusion is the spread of these gas molecules throughout a container. Now, effusion is a similar type of process. So going back to my perfume bottle example, let's say I go ahead and smash that bottle of perfume in the corner of the room, and really quickly what I do is I cover the smashed bottle up with a box and I poke a hole in that box. Now, the rate at which the gas molecules go through that little pinhole, that's the measure of effusion. So effusion is looking at the passing of gas molecules through a small opening. So what we can do is we can talk about Graham's Law. And this is usually Graham's Law of Effusion or Graham's Law of Diffusion. And it goes back to one of the equations that we talked about. And what we said was that the average speed equals the square root of 8 times r times t over pi times the molar mass. Now again, remember the take-home message in one of the quizzes I gave you. And that was that the average velocity is proportional to the square root of 1 over m. And this is what Graham's Law states. The rate of diffusion, we can go ahead and say that is equivalent to the velocity or proportional to the velocity. And so what we can do is we can look at the rate of diffusion of gas 1 divided by the rate of diffusion of gas 2, and that's going to equal the square root of the molar masses of gas 2 over gas 1. And so experimentally, Graham's law is really useful. What we can do is we can compare the rates of effusion and diffusion of two different gases, and we can relate them to their molar masses. So let's go ahead and practice one of these out. Go ahead and look at this quiz question, and when you're done answering this question, go ahead and mark the right answer. All right, let's go ahead and start with Graham's equation. So for rates of effusion and diffusion, I'm going to use the average velocity. So in this case, I'm going to make the unknown gas gas number one. And gas number two is going to be oxygen. Now, if I read the equation, what I see is this unknown gas diffuses four times faster than oxygen. So let's go ahead and write an equation for this. So I have my unknown gas, and it's going to move four times faster than oxygen. So what I can do is I can make a substitution. I can put four times the velocity of oxygen up on top, the velocity of oxygen on bottom, and I'll be sure to write my molar masses correctly, where I had the molar mass of oxygen on top and the molar mass of my unknown gas on the bottom. The velocity of oxygen cancels out, and I can go ahead and square both sides. So I get 16 equals the molar mass of oxygen, and I can look this up on the periodic table. That's gonna be 32 grams per mole. And on the bottom, I have the molar mass of my unknown. Solving for the molar mass of my unknown, I find that it is two grams per mole. So what's really important when using Graham's Law is that you guys make sure that you're putting your variables in the correct place. And remember, the velocity of gas 1 goes on top, its molar mass goes on the bottom. And the converse is true for gas 2. The velocity goes on the bottom, its molar mass is up on top. All right, gentle people, let's take a little aside and talk about some practical uses for gas diffusion and effusion. One way this is employed is the enrichment of uranium for nuclear fuels. 
If you were to go out and mine uranium, what you would find is there are two very common isotopes, uranium-235 and uranium-238. However, only uranium-235 is useful when doing a nuclear reaction. Now, the natural abundance of uranium-235 is only about 0.7%. Now, this isn't good enough to run reactions in power plants or to be used in nuclear missiles. For power plants, you need about 3 to 5% uranium-235. And for nuclear missiles, you need a very high content of uranium-235, about 90%. So what we have to do is to increase our uranium-235 composition in our uranium sample. And the way that we can do that is to enrich our uranium. What you see here is a picture of the Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee. The building that I'm depicting here was used to enrich the uranium for the nuclear missiles used in World War II. To give you an idea about the scale of this building, this building is one mile long and about six stories tall. It encompasses about 43 acres in area. And this was used to run one reaction throughout the whole building to enrich uranium. Now the way they did this is they made uranium into a gaseous compound. UF6. Now we have uranium-238 and we have uranium-235. The 235, the uranium that we want, is lighter, so it moves slightly faster than the uranium-238. It moves about 0.4% faster. So what they did is they started piping in the mixture of gases. They had a container with little holes going throughout. Now what would happen is that the faster uranium-235 would move up and the heavier 238 tended to stay at the bottom. And so what we can do is we can increase the amount of uranium-235. But remember, I'm only doing a 0.4% enrichment. And so that's why it took a very large building across a huge amount of area to purify things to weapons grade material. Nowadays, they've introduced the concept of centrifuges, and this helps expedite the process of taking uranium-235 out of naturally occurring samples of uranium. Well, I hope that made sense, Chem1A, and remember to stay safe.